You are here for a presentation, a panel, about how the Wazanar Arrangements Export Control <coughs> of Intrusion Software affects the security industry. The panel will be moderated by Kim Zetter. Without further, without further ado. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, you probably already know what Vasanar arrangement is, but I'll give you just a brief introduction, and then I'll introduce our panelists. Um, and I just want to say up front, we want this to be participatory, so we don't want to leave questions for the end. If you have questions that come up for you at any time, come to the microphones, and we'll take um, a, a break and take your questions if we can. So the Vasanar arrangement is an export control, uh, it's not a treaty, but it's an agreement between 41 nations, including most of Western Europe and the US. And it's not a binding uh, agreement. Uh, I'm sorry, it, it's not a legally binding agreement. But what happens is that the 41 member nations then are expected to pass um, export regulations or rules or codify um, in their own nations that would either um, block the exportation of certain products and services or um, require a license for them. And in 2013, December 2013, the Boston Arrangement was amended to <coughs> add surveillance software, actually it was called intrusion software, uh, to the rules. And now um, member countries are in the process of implementing their own rules uh, to comply with that. EU has already implemented some that went into effect earlier this year. And the U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce uh, is, a division of it, is currently proposing its rules. And if any of you have been following it, it's caused a lot of controversy because of the broad definition of what they're using for intrusion software and all the other products that would be affected around it. So they've had their first round of uh, comments um, and they've announced last week that given the number of comments that they've received so far, they will be going through a second round of commenting and, and presumably that will result in a second proposed rules. But we're only going to talk about the proposed rules we have because that's all we can address at this point. Um, so I want to introduce our panel. We've got an excellent panel here. It's can't be a more perfect panel to discuss this because the people here have broad experience and expertise in a lot of areas around Vasanar and that touch on it and are affected by it. So I'm going to start with my left here. This is Nate Cardozo. He's a staff attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation focusing on technology, privacy, and First Amendment and other free expression issues. Uh, he works on EFF's Coders Rights Project, counseling academics, researchers, uh, security professionals, and hackers. And he also manages EFF's, EFF's Who Has Your Back uh, project, which analyzes um, how uh, internet service providers, not just internet service providers, but service providers are handling your data. Next to him is Dino Dizovi. Got it right. Um, is currently mobile security lead for Square, but he's been working in information security uh, for over a decade with experience both in defense and offense, and his, has extensive experience in red teaming, uh, penetration testing, software security. He started his career with the illustrious group at stake and has worked on red teaming uh, to examine both commercial companies and government customers. He's co-authored several security books, including the iOS Hacker's Handbook, the, War the Mac Hacker's Handbook, and is renowned for winning the first Pwn to Own contest at Kansas West in 2007. Um, Colin Anderson is a Washington DC based researcher focused on measurement and control on the internet including network ownership and access restrictions with an emphasis on countries that restrict the flow of information. Uh, he monitors the international sale of censorship equipment which includes exploring alternative means of communications to bypass normal channels of control and works on open data projects to shed light on the increasingly sophisticated restrictions implemented by re repressive regimes. Katie Musuris was an instrumental in getting Microsoft to finally launch a bug bounty program during the time she worked for the company. She's currently Chief Policy Officer with HackerOne, which helps coordinate and manage bug bounty programs for other companies. In addition to her work with HackerOne, she's a visiting scholar with MIT Sloan School, doing research on the vulnerability economy and exploit markets. Uh, Katie started her career, however, not in computers, but in biological sciences, working at the Bioinformatics, Bioinformatics Lab at MIT on the Human Genome Project. And at the end, finally, uh, we've got Adriel Desatel is a CEO of NetraGuard, uh, which provides threat assessment and, assessment and advanced penetration testing services. Uh, NetraGuard also develops and brokers exploits, zero days and otherwise, uh, for its own use and for sale, or at least it did until recently. Um, Adriel announced uh, last month that he was uh, halting 
uh, the sale of exploits after hacking team was hacked and um, there were confirmation of what we'd all suspected and known uh, that the company was selling its intrusion software to repressive regimes and using it uh, to um, spy on uh, activists, human rights activists and political activists. Um, so it's particularly apropos uh, for what we're talking about today uh, because one of the main reasons for amending the Vassanar arrangement um, or cited reasons is hacking team and its like. Um, and so I think uh, Adriel is going to have a particularly interesting um, input into all of this. And so feel free to ask everyone questions when uh, they come up. Come up to the mic, like I said, um, and we'll break uh, from the questions that I have. But I want to start with just an overview. Um, a lot of the, there's a lot of confusion about what Vassanar says and what it actually would um, do and what, how it's interpreted. And so I want Nate uh, to start with this, and I'm also going to ask Colin to step in after him, um, to tell us exactly what, do, what does it say, um, what are the most problematic parts of it, and how um, those parts could be interpreted. Uh, great. Is this one? OK. Thanks, Kim. Uh, so I'm Nate Cardozo. I'm a staff attorney at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, as Kim said. And I, uh, I, I do some work in this area, mainly vis-a-vis -vis counseling uh, security researchers. Uh, I also submitted uh, comments to the, to the Commerce Department in, in July uh, on, uh, on our own as EFF, as well as uh, in, uh, in concert with Colin down the table and a number of other people. So the Vassanar arrangement, and I, I think uh, Colin maybe can, can give uh, a history uh, of it and, and what it actually controls, but the reason that, that we're here, the reason that we're in this place is because of companies essentially like Hacking Team, like Gamma, uh, the, the producer of FinFisher. Uh, these are companies that the human rights community uh, has had a problem with for a long time. Uh, they, they sell software uh, to, to governments who do really nasty things with it. Uh, and the, the Western democracies uh, who, who host the companies that are selling uh, this kind of software to, to regimes like Sudan, Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, uh, Bahrain, you name it, um, weren't happy with that situation. I don't, I don't know, uh, Colin, do you want to talk about the history well, sure. of, of Vassar itself? Sure. Does this It'll come up? Can you hear? Okay. <coughs> So, so the history of, of these controls go back about half a decade. Can you speak In, up? Maybe, maybe use the desk button. Yeah. Okay. I can't hear you very well. Okay. We'll switch to this. So these controls date back to about half a decade in which you've had increasing visibility into the, uh, into the, the facilitation of human rights abuses by uh, Western uh, surveillance technologies. Increasingly, this became evident during the Arab Spring in which both by research methods but also by disclosures of information, we started to see specific names. Those specific names, such as AMSIS in Libya, such as, as Trovacor in Bahrain, such as a, a, a hacking team in Bahrain, became evidence of, of what people knew, which was that there was an, an, an emergent market for the, the, surveil, uh, the, the sale of sophisticated technologies in order to allow governments that weren't necessarily tech savvy to conduct their own campaigns of intrusion and surveillance against their citizens. Not only their own citizens, but actually often diasporas abroad. Because of that, especially because of the diaspora component, there was increasing pressure on governments to, to start to, to uh, restrict the sale of these to certain states. So actually, I want to step back a second and, and note that, in fact, the two controls that we're talking about are not the first controls that were conducted for the sake of, of, of privacy implications. Actually, in the 2012 plenary, there was, a, there was uh, restrictions on uh, MC catchers, and actually, incidentally, uh, catcher catchers, uh, that, that came into to effect quietly. In the United States, these are done under what's called the sur surreptitious listening control. And that's actually a highly strict uh, uh, control. When we start to use some of these terms, we'll, we'll use terms like presumption of denial, which means effectively don't even bother to, to, to try to get a license from us because we're probably not going to prove it. Actually, these had already been in, in effect in the United States as of, of 2013. So you know, that, that sort of benchmarks the, the beginning of, of the use of what had been predominantly sort of a, a, an anti-nuclear proliferation treaty, anti-conventional weapons treaty, 
uh, as, as a mechanism in which to control for the, the proliferation of of uh, surveillance technologies and technologies that human, have human rights and foreign intelligence purposes. So what we have is we have currently two proposals that have been implemented in the EU and are being considered in the United States. One is the intrusion software control. <clears throat> and it's really important that when we talk about these things, we do so uh, in detail because these are actually highly complex and a lot of the discussion, at least initially, there's been a maturity, an increase of maturity, but at least initially, was predicated on, I think, uh, misunderstandings of, of what these, these controls are. So we have, to, we have to be very careful when we discuss it. Actually, intrusion software wasn't controlled. A sort of periphery of technologies around intrusion software will. For the sake of time, I probably shouldn't explain the totality of it, or yeah. maybe Nate can. So this was the first control. Uh, actually, that was present, presented by the British government. The British government had been increasingly uh, pressured domestically and internationally because of the presence of companies such as Gamma. Uh, they had, in, I think, 2012, actually gone to the great lengths of using encryption controls to be able to, uh, to regulate the flow of Gamma outside of the UK, and then Gamma fled uh, to a, another market. Uh, concurrently, what you had during the, the plenary was the, the discussion of the uh, IP network surveillance control. And this came out of France uh, due to the involvement of AIMSYS in, in, in Libya, the very highly uh, uh, publicized involvement of AIMSYS in Libya, uh, providing you know, substantial network equipment, substantial surveillance equipment uh, to the Qaddafi government. Again, when we talk about these sorts of things, we're using specific terms. Um, but these two terms are defined. Sometimes the definition is wrong and we should talk about that. But when I say IP network surveillance, I'm not talking about just DPI. There's, a, there's a, actually a seven point, uh, if this and this and this and this and this and this, that defines what IP network surveillance is uh, for the purposes of these controls. And, and we, should, we can talk about that and people can look that up. Uh, but I want to make that point very clear. So these started to come out. And these were implemented in the EU. And where we're at is they were not implemented in the United States. In fact, the United States is generally the first, uh, the first state to implement it. The way that the US enforces it, the way that the US interprets it, interprets it generally actually defines what it means for the rest of the world. But what you saw was a very sort of public, um, publicly evident inability to understand how to codify these rules, especially because these rules didn't really come out of the prerogatives of the United States. Uh, and so, in fact, uh, in one case, the, uh, the Department of Commerce, who is responsible for the implementation in consultation with a broader array of, of, uh, of agencies, you know, put out something when they, they implemented some of the rules that came out that year, and they said the cybersecurity rules will come out in September. September passes and nothing, and nothing, and nothing, and nothing, until very quietly it drops uh, in, in May, May 20th. And so I think that's in a very, very belabored, this is where we're at, where we sort of have this uh, Department of Commerce trying to figure out what these rules are that to an extent came from Europe, uh, and, and yeah. Um, and the rules that we got on May 20th are confusing to say uh, the least. The, uh, the, the Commerce Department didn't have experience with this kind of regulation. Uh, the, the EARs, the, the Commerce Department Export Regulation Regime, uh, is, is usually guided that by, by industry. Um, there, there are what's called uh, there are technical committees that advise the Bureau of Industry and Security and the Commerce Department on, on how to craft these, on how to craft the regulations uh, appropriately. And the regulations that we got uh, are really horrendously vague. Uh, and, and I can talk about why that's a problem from a legal standpoint a little bit later. Um, and we got a 60-day comment period that closed on July 20th. Uh, everybody in the industry uh, and their mother, including, including me, including Colin, including Katie, uh, including Dino, submitted comments. Uh, and it was a resounding, uh, what the heck did you guys just do? Uh, and, and that's where we are. Uh, commerce has, since the close of the comment period, done what a lot of people urge, which is say, oops, we know we screwed up on this one. We're going to revise uh, the rule, uh, propose a, a, a revision, and we'll have another comment period. So that's where we are. We're at the, we're at the critical stage of uh, talking commerce through how to make these rules 
implementable without completely screwing the security industry. Uh, so uh, just sort of a quick question before we go on to sort of what the problem areas are. Does anyone know if when Vassanar um, was being amended, um, was there the kind of kickback in Europe um, around the member states when they were de deciding this? Um, well, and did they consult seriously with any technologists or anyone else? So I think part of the reason why this is exposed as a conversation is in part, for one, the contours of the US legal regime are a little bit more difficult. We have practices such as deemed exports that add complexity, mm -hmm. but also to a certain extent, um, Biz actually brought this upon himself in not necessarily a, a bad way, which is to say the, the U.S. government more publicly debated the meaning of these rules than the EU member states. And so, for example, the Department of Commerce did not have to legally open up the 60-day comment period. They did. Um, they very clearly engaged in a process in order to solicit opinions and to state what their implementation is. And so the fact that this is a argument in the United States is a product of a more open deliberative process than seems to have existed in, in Europe. It is possible, as, I, as far as I know, the Japanese government had gone through consultations. Um, there is a language barrier that, uh, that is, is difficult there. Um, but. But this is in part just born out of commerce going through a public learning process. Okay. Uh, I just want to remind all the panelists, answer any question, jump in, and also the audience if you have questions. Um, so I think we should move on to, um, so what exactly are the problematic areas um, and the repercussions or possible repercussions from them? Um, I, I know that it can get really um, detailed, so let's keep it a little high. Um, on the details so that we can not get sort of bogged down between like what's an exploit and what's not an exploit and all that. Sure. Anyone can jump in. I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, first also I have to say, as uh, is on, uh, I speak only on behalf of myself, though current former employers. Um, I am a security researcher. My concern with this is how it will curtail my ability to do research as a hobby or even professionally as well. Some of the more problematic areas are what Colin mentioned, the deemed exports. So for instance, in the BIS language, there are talks about the technology required for development of intrusion tools and proprietary research and the deemed exports thereof. Um, and so what that makes, whether it becomes problematic is, for instance, uh, uh, yes. So but first off, I'm also not a lawyer. So I look to uh, my right for any corrections on what these actually mean. Also as a security researcher, I don't want to have to consult a lawyer before I go to work to know if I'm going to go to jail or not. Right, and that's key. Um, but uh, deemed export, as I understand it in the ER, EAR definition, includes oral transmission. So for instance, and also so um, proprietary research is anything that is not public or not immediately deemed for publication and technology required for the development of intrusion tools includes, um, I assume, vulnerabilities and techniques for bypassing protective controls. This might be hiding from an antivirus engine or so on. Where this runs into very sticky details is if, um, if I find a vulnerability in Joe's PHP whatever, because none of these regulations specify anything about what the vulnerabilities are in, or the class of software, or the size of the user base, um, and I use that to say, you know what, here's a pitfall that um, we need to be aware of and we need to defend against, and maybe it's not worth my time to, I, I know I'm a jerk, to you know, go through the disclosure process and open myself up to potential risks that way. Um, but I know, like, all right, we should be aware of issues like this. I can't communicate that to a non-US person that I work with. Um, you know, a coworker on a visa, if I communicate any of this, um, I am running afoul of these uh, regulations as I understand them, not being a lawyer. That's right. Uh, and as, as Dino said, one of the, one of the more problematic uh, areas here is that techniques are controlled. Um, so if you want to use a, a software analogy, even if an exploit itself is not controlled, even if the code is not controlled, the comments are probably controlled because you're describing how to do it. Um, techniques and technology I, I, are controlled. Before you get to that, there's a, there's a, there's, there is one finer point, and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the proposed rules are making a distinction between exploit and zero-day exploit. So anything that you describe about exploits, am I incorrect? No, so they don't differentiate. So I think we're kind of going in too far, which is, uh, firstly, which is to say, one of, the, one of the things that we're talking about is, as a part of the rules, 
the intrusion software regulate doesn't regulate intrusion software. The control doesn't regulate intrusion software uh, itself. It regulates the basically the C2 infrastructure. And as, as a part of that, it regulates what's called technology for development of intrusion software. So this is what was given to the Department of Commerce. This is something in which all of a sudden are, people are trying to figure out what is the what is the uh, what is intrusion software? Is it an exploit? <coughs> what is the uh, technology for the development of intrusion software mean? This is exactly what, what Dino is referring to. Is intrusion software a vulnerability? Is technology for a discussion of the vulnerability? An exploit, uh, so when this came out, uh, the Department of Commerce, very, you know, again to their credit, engaged in an FAQ process. And they took questions on a, on a weekly basis, posted it to an FAQ, Often it made people more confused, but sometimes it was clarifying. Maybe the more confusing point is they said, look, actually, if uh, not all intrusion software, not all exploits are intrusion software. They have to meet this extended criteria. It's not that extended. Um, but if they do, remember, intrusion software is not, is not actually what's controlled. So what they do say, so zero days doesn't factor into this, but what's interesting as a, as a component is they say, uh, so a part of the way that Vassanar works is member states have to implement language specifically, but they have flexibility in the way in which they implement it. What, what the like sort of, if there's a presumption of denial, how hard it is to get a license, who can't get it. They have flexibility in that respect. So what Biz said is we are going to propose that as a part of it, we have a licensing process that has a disclosure requirement. And this disclosure requirement is actually kind of onerous, including potentially uh, the disclosure of source code. But one of the things that it says is, we're going to have a presumption of denial in the case of, of intrusion software systems that include zero days or root kit capabilities. So it's not that they're regulating zero days themselves. They're saying, if a product has the possibility of, of supporting root kit, or, root, root kit or zero day activities, then you're going to be up for a presumption of denial, which is a, a death sentence for an export. Well, because that's very vague, because for instance, Metasploit, you can just drop in a zero day exploit written as a Metasploit module, now, and that's trivial. So uh, Metasploit has capabilities for zero day exploits. By that definition, every single penetration testing framework on the planet, by that definition, by it being a framework, has support for zero day capabilities and they didn't say whether it included it. Right. Um, so I, I want to stick stay on that part. Uh, Katie, I wanted to bring you in and Adriel as well, um, particularly about the bug bounty program. So Dino's talked about how this might affect research and uh, communication with workers. Um, also, I, I wanted to address one other issue uh, in terms of uh, implementing your own security software on your systems if you have overseas offices. Uh, presumably that's going to have some kind of effect as well. Um, but Katie, you want to talk about uh, the bug bounty programs and how this is going to affect uh, disclosure processes in general um, and bug bounty programs in particular? So bug bounties um, are simply a, a, an incentive for vulnerability disclosure. It is a subset of vulnerability disclosure overall. And the way that the Wassenaar arrangement threatens the primitives of vulnerability disclosure are in some of the ways that, that other panelists have been discussing. Um, if I could simplify what, what it is, what we mean by techniques, um, I can give you an example of where uh, had the Vlasenar arrangement as it stands been passed a few months earlier in 2013, uh, you mentioned that, that I was the one who, who pushed forward the Microsoft bug bounty programs. One of those programs was specifically designed to award security researchers for coming up with new exploitation techniques. The language in the mitigation bypass bounty, that's a $100,000 bounty that Microsoft has paid out at least five times since, since then, uh, to learn about new exploitation techniques, the language is nearly identical to the language that is in the Vassanar arrangement about exactly what is controlled. So if you think about it, this is something that defense needs to learn about as, as early as possible as opposed to offense, which can use existing techniques such as return-oriented programming would be an example of, I'm pretty sure everyone can hear me, but um, I think I'm the loudest one on this panel. So uh, return-oriented programming would be an example of an existing mitigation bypass technique that offense can use to bypass all the protective countermeasures on, you know, on a given platform. 
That is an existing technique. Offense doesn't necessarily need to invest in learning about new techniques. However, defense absolutely needs to learn about these techniques. So an example of a bug bounty program or a bounty program that would have been actually not even possible to launch had Vassanar been passed a few months earlier. I mean, I even confirmed this with the TWC lawyer who helped me do it um, a, a few, I don't know, I think a couple of weeks ago, that I don't think it would have been possible. So distinctly, this is getting in the way of legitimate vulnerability disclosure, let alone research. So I wanted to add actually something about a hypothetical situation. Let's say Microsoft were designing mitigations, and as part of that, they were they had a team that was uh, investigating new techniques. And, and that team included a non-US person. So unless Microsoft publishes those techniques, those exploitation techniques, which I don't think Microsoft is the type of company to be publishing offensive techniques, um, as I understand it, they would be violating um, the BIS proposed rules by having their offensive researchers in-house communicate to their defensive researchers who are working on improving mitigations if any of those two teams included a non-US person. Correct, and that, that, that gets us to the, the deemed export um, right. stuff as well. Because it's a deemed export if you, if you essentially tell a foreign national, even if that foreign national is employed by your company. So that's one of the ways in which the deemed export um, uh, provision of this is damaging to even inside the same company communication about these, these techniques that, that you would need to actually implement defenses. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering though if, uh, you know, we're, look, we're all talking about worst case scenarios and I'm wondering, I, I understand the, the need to have precise uh, language and to have narrowly defined uh, terms and all of this, um, but are we making a big deal about this and also um, the other question is, you know, it's only an export license, what's the big deal? So from a constitutional law perspective, uh, being the lawyer on the panel, uh, we have a doctrine in the United States uh, that, that the shorthand is uh, void for vagueness. If there's a criminal statute that an average person of ordinary intelligence can't tell whether their conduct would lead to criminal penalties or not, that statute is unconstitutional. So if an average person of ordinary intelligence, and, and this is a, a very simplified description, but an average person of ordinary intelligence can't tell if whatever they're about to do is a violation of the Vosner arrangement or the BIS implementation thereof, that statute is unconstitutional on its face. So we are making a big deal of how vague this is because it has serious uh, legal impl uh, implications from a US constitutional law perspective. So we don't just have to get the definitions precise, we have to get the definitions understandable or they are per se unconstitutional. And what are the repercussions? Let's just address that and I'll come to you. Oh, no, no, no. I think, Katie, did you want to say something? But I wanted to ask him, what exactly are the repercussions if you don't understand it and you do violate? Oh, well, then you have a complete defense. No, no, no. Uh, so, I mean, what are, what are, the, what are the potential? What, is it, are we talking about a fine? Are we talking about... Oh, no, there's, there's it's, uh, there are criminal and civil penalties. So there, you can go to jail uh, for violating... It's like two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, two, two, two I mean, fifty in, in five years. It, it gets into willful violation. Right, willful or, or just a mission, um, sin of a mission. Katie, did you want to? So what I was going to say is, uh, you know, one of the big questions, uh, and, and I think you were trying to get at it in terms of consultation um, with the right technologists, et cetera, when drafting the original version, is I think they did attempt to essentially threat model this when they were putting it together. What we are essentially pointing out is that their threat model missed a few key elements. Um, they didn't understand vulnerability disclosure because they thought vulnerability disclosure would be protected because they assumed that every piece of technology involved in a disclosure would eventually become public. They did not understand the distinction between, uh, between a technique which may not become public and a vulnerability or an exploit or all of the rest of the things. So that was essentially a gap in their threat modeling of this regulation. That is essentially why we're in this place where we're struggling to push back on these definitions, really crisply define them, but also point out areas where they misunderstood the mechanics of what they were trying to control itself. So, did you want to say something? Um, I wanted to in inject a point, um, going back to the drawing board of Wassener, like as, a researcher, and I understand the uh, desire to control surveillance tools, and I would wish that the language was crafted more focusing on the aspects of the tools that make them surveillance tools, 
and that there would cause less uh, collateral damage to penetration testing tools and other things that may e provide external instructions to system processes, may exfiltrate some data, but once you start getting towards the aspects of the, you know, the tools that Hacking Team and Gamma Group produce that make them especially like offensive, like, I don't know, capturing Skype audio streams and like bypassing encryption that way. There's no mention of anything like that, and these are the things that make these products especially useful for these regimes. Um, and it would, uh, in my mind, be more clear if they focused on that. But don't you think, though, that, uh, I mean, especially when delivering you know, real penetration testing services, don't you think that there are a lot of tools that we're going to use, because I know we do, uh, that might also be easily classified as surveillance tools? There, there definitely are. And um, having done you know, years of penetration testing myself, like, I did remember uh, liking to add some flair of a screenshot or a, take a picture with the camera. Sure. Um, however, I feel like you know, in most engagements, um, capturing audio streams from the target computer for an extended period of time, capturing video streams, um, capturing you know, personal communication in, that is normally encrypted, once you're entering into that category, like, you know, if you delivered, a, as a penetration tester, if you delivered a report that did that, your customer would be pretty upset for invading the privacy of their employees in the scope of the engagement. You can, yes, technically exfiltrate some data, but just to show your access. So, and these are things that are, I think, unique to these surveillance tools that um, I don't see being uh, running in common with a penetration test engagement or their tools. Do you so, want to have, I just want to go to a comment after you, so go ahead. So with a lot of the higher threat engagements that we do, um, we have customers that will ask us to reproduce the type of attack that somebody might see coming from an enemy state, mm -hmm. right? And we have customers that want to see just how much we can reach, um, and, and they want to see how far we can dig in the privacy of their employees. Things like turning a webcam, just like you mentioned. Um, to facilitate that, we ended up building a tool that we called Radon, and we use it for our, what we call a platinum level service, right? It's a high threat service. And Radon uh, does a lot of stuff along with, you know, the potential for data exfiltration. Uh, it does all the monitoring. It's completely undetectable. It bypasses antivirus. It does all these different things. What the customer ends up getting at the end is a report that shows not only where vulnerabilities are, but the paths to compromise, so it shows the path to access the critical data, and it shows the different paths that we're able to use to covertly exfiltrate data. And when we're able to hit that hard and dig that deep and use that level of threat to test a customer's infrastructure, we can provide the customer with the method for mediation that can defeat those higher level threats. I, I understand uh, <clears throat> the value, and I 100% agree with you on the value of the attack path as well, and showing um, the choice that the attacker makes to get to that data. Um, but I personally feel that, like, in a penetration testing engagement, like, a single picture of a webcam is enough to demonstrate. You know, maybe not a live video feed, you know, or just saying, saying look, we're, we have full access on the system. We've exfiltrated two gigabytes of stub data. That doesn't mean you need to steal, you know, actually, actually exfiltrate. Yo, we exfiltrated, you know, two gigabytes of actual PII. Yeah. You know, you don't have to do that. But um, just demonstrating two gigabytes of data undetected that may... Um, match the regular expression for credit card number, for instance, yeah. um, they are enough to show the access and the capability. And there's a, I think, a well-defined line there that could differentiate surveillance tools that are used for you know, this type of surveillance from the tools that the penetration, you know, the security industry uses every day. We have a question for a second. So uh, my question is kind of twofold, you know. Um, one question is, um, Export restrictions on software, it just the idea of it in and of itself just seems illogical. You know, you're restricting, say, source code. So someone's thoughts, how do you enforce that in a, in a global internet, you know? And um, is this just financial, like, software you pay for? So free and open source software, things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, how, how do you, how do you uh, enforce an export restriction on software? So, so actually, twofold. Uh, actually, partly as work, a result of the work of, of the EFF, open source software is considered speech and is not controlled by the EAR. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there exists within Bostonar something called the general software note. And what that is, is it's a decontrol note, which says this doesn't apply to. And what it says is, 
is that if this is available commercially off of the shelf, it is not controlled by Vosnar. Part of the reason we're at this point of controversy is that what the Department of Commerce said is there's only one thing that is not included in the general software note, and that's encryption. Uh, and, and what the Department of Commerce said was they said, actually, so we regulate encryption, we see these things, we have a presumption that everything that would be controlled under uh, intrusion software already employs encryption, so we're going to remove the general software note. It's called License Exemption TSU in the United States. And so, in part, what they start to do in, do in doing so is they start to winnow it down to a select piece of software, which is things that are not, this is their intention, things that are not commercially, or that are not commercially available, that they, ha they are sold to a restricted user base and exercise some level of exclusivity in who can consume it. And so where that starts to get away from this being sort of an open source collaborative pro project, ideally, into something that is being sold to, some, to somebody uh, privately, restricted highly, and sold at a very expensive rate. This is the, this is the intention of the controls generally. But I have two points. One, uh, none of the controls, as, as I recall, mention sale. Um, they only have a distinction between public sure. and not. And likening the software to speech, I agree that treating free software as speech <coughs> is great. But if only free software is speech and only commercial software is speech, let's liken that to publications. Books are speech, blog posts and tweets are speech, private correspondence, not speech. Uh, so it, 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 it shows that like, um, there's, a, a wide, there's a wide variety of free and protected speech. Mm -hmm. And these two categories are not sufficient. Mm -hmm. We have another question from the audience. Yeah, you mentioned encryption. I was wondering um, the mechanism to implement uh, these rules. Are they comparable to the 90s when we had the export restriction on strong encryption, um, where it sounded like we had similar uh, the Department of uh, Commerce, if I remember correctly, enforcing it? Is it the same mechanism in place, just not covering encryption but uh, uh, software? It, it's similar. So okay. in the 90s, encryption was regulated under ITAR. Uh, the, the rules that we're talking about are EAR, so Department of Commerce versus Department of State. Uh, during EFF's case, uh, uh, on behalf of Dan Bernstein, against the regulation of encryption in ITAR, uh, part of the way that the government uh, reacted to that case was moving from ITAR to EAR. So it's a very similar mechanism. Uh, the, the controls that we're looking at today look more like uh, the, the ITAR restrictions from, from back in the 90s than they do uh, like the encryption controls in EAR today. One of the things that I think we, we should learn from, from those original crypto wars is how much those controls ended up doing the opposite of what was intended, which is weakening the security of the internet as a whole. We are looking at essentially the same possibility with unfortunately well-intentioned regulations. And where I see this, where I see this is where uh, we have regulators and lawmakers who are straddling um, an age where conventional weapons could be regulated in such a way, but cyber weapons are an entirely different, different object um, for very many reasons and are much more difficult to control using export, uh, export controls um, for, for technology. Um, if I were to sum it up, we are in danger of entering a prohibition era for exploitation and offense research. And much like the prohibition of alcohol that, that occurred in the United States for what, 12 miserable years, um, we, do not need, uh, we do not need to suffer the consequences of, of such a state. I think at this point, we are, we are at a point where we can, we can stop that from happening. I'll also add to your prohibition uh, metaphor, which I love, by the way. Um, regulating something that you can make in your home in your bathtub um, is problematic. Um. <laughs> Right, and but, I mean, as John Gilmore said in 93, the net interprets censorship as damage and routes around it, and that's equally applicable here. But, but to belabor the alcohol reference, there's a difference between the moonshine <laughs> and what the professional distillery is putting out. True, but not in the scope of these regulations. 
basically there's no distinction of a right. vulnerability in Joe's PHP program that five people use and, or a vulnerability in Windows or Android that a billion people use. And, and that's fundamentally the importance of this conversation over whether the general software note, whether uh, what sort of license exemptions are brought to bear because this is one of the things uh, civil society actually engaged in this issue starting from the issuance. And this was one of the important points was there is a fundamental difference between what you know, I as a computer science was you know, like doing to screw with my friends uh, back, in, back in high school or back in college and what hacking team is putting out and the level of professionalism and support. And what the Vassanar control framework allows for is a differentiation. However, what the Department of Commerce has issued as a proposed rule, not a final rule, does not differentiate these two things. However, the, I, in my reading of the Wassenaar, which I read in the last, last couple nights ago, like the full text, um, I needed some help sleeping. Um, and uh, they did not make that distinction either. General software note. Um, it, attempts, it attempts to make that distinction. With the, uh, well, I could fall off the line. Um, Adriel, I wanted to uh, talk about, so we, we're talking about sort of the difficulties of regulating this, um, and also just the difficulty of knowing who your end user is. Um, so after it was exposed in the hacking team emails that you had sold an exploit to hacking team, you announced that you were going to end the sale of exploits. Um, and, and you feel that the, there is a need for some kind of export control um, and that could help you know who your end user is in part. So yeah. talk about that a bit. I think, I think there has to be, I mean, so zero days are here to stay, right? Software is fallible and uh, everybody is going to perform research, the good guys, the bad guys. And people are going to have exploits. They're going to be breaking into systems. They're going to have zero days. I'm not going to tell people about, uh, you know, about the zero days. Um, Wassner is designed today, and I'll, I'll get into what I think these controls should be. <coughs> it really prevents uh, legitimate researchers for, uh, from, from doing a lot of the work that they should do, but it almost empowers the bad guys because the bad guys aren't going to care. The rogue nations aren't going to care about what Lassner says, right? So it's a hindrance. I think that, um, I think that there needs to be some kind of a framework uh, that holds the end users accountable um, for, I guess the word ethical is really up for debate, but ethical use um, of, of zero days and the, and the capabilities they provide, right? I mean, one example that I love using, everybody always accuses me of using the children example, is what the FBI did in 2013 when they busted a massive child port ring with a zero day, a Firefox zero day. You know, that was, in my opinion, I don't think anybody would argue, an ethical use of a zero day exploit. I mean, it ended up doing something really good. But then you have people like Hacking Team, which thank God we only ever sold one zero day to, <laughs> which is great, and it got exposed, which is even better. Uh, then you have people like Hacking Team that, that frankly, are, are just dishonest, they lie. Uh, they don't even honor their contracts, quite candidly. Um, and and uh, they don't care who they provide their technology to. Um, that kind of technology in the wrong hands, unfortunately, is very damaging and dangerous. In the right hands, though, it's necessary. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, about the idea of actually controlling zero days. Uh, you know, we don't really control guns. I mean, a gun is an inanimate object, and a zero day is also an inanimate, an inanimate object, uh, but we control the users. And so I think that a better framework might be something that focuses on the users. You know, if you're going to be building a framework like what Hacking Team was doing, or like, you know, Gamma Group, or whatever else may be out there, maybe you have to be licensed and you have to have some kind of a process that you go through that says, hey, these are the people who can buy this framework and use this framework. I think that trying to regulate zero days, as we're seeing today, you know, is, is a really dangerous thing to do. I think it's going to have a really big impact on security as a whole, a negative impact. Mm -hmm. And it's not just research that's being affected either. It's performance of services. It's incident response. I mean, we have guys in Europe, and you know, we deliver penetration tests at all hours, and we use different team members that we have. We have an office out in Luxembourg. If we were, you know, we use a research-based methodology when we're delivering our services. So, if we're going after an infrastructure and we identify a new vulnerability, we can't, you know, we can't necessarily provide that information, as far as I understand, the last year, overseas to the people who might be working on the project. And also, what about, you know, what about incident response? What happens if you're a business? 
when you have an incident in one of your overseas offices and you have a piece of technology that's local, but for some reason you can't export that technology because it violates something in last year and you have to respond to this incident before it becomes critically damaging. Well, so you have to go apply for a license. Maybe the time you apply for the license, the damage is done. Mm. And there, there's a lot of different things with it that are, that are just bad. And I don't think that focusing on zero days specifically, or not that it is, but I, I don't think that... I, I don't think its focus is right. I, okay. I think that the focus should be different. So I, we're running out of time, so I just got a lot of people standing, and I want to get to some questions. Um, we'll go with you first. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to come back on, on something you said at the start, that the whole basis of the Wassenaar changes was down to surveillance where being spotted in the Arab Spring. I'm a journalist, and we've been reporting on those gamma bastards for years now, before the Arab Spring, and nothing, nothing was, was done about it. So why, why now? Uh, so it's because the process is slow. It's because there wasn't a sufficient amount of legal mechanisms. In some cases, such as use of the encryption controls to regulate them, that led to them leaving the country. That's also an important point as to why unilateral controls and unilateral over-enforcement of controls is ineffective compared to a, a, a harmonized multilateral regime, which the Vasna arrangement is supposed to do. Obviously, people can go and move to, you know, like China and export. Um, but this is, the, uh, this, is the, this is the interest of providing a sufficient amount of tools to create a regulatory structure in order to exercise at least some sort of government oversight and some sort of transparency and accountability towards those, those companies. So we have time for just one more question. Uh, hi. Just one question. Um, what effect, if any, would this have on threat intelligence services that claim to go out and mine data all across the web and the dark web and gather that for their clients? Would they be affected by this? Um, lawyer answer, it depends. <laughs> okay, we have time for another question, apparently. <laughs> I, I, I turned away some people. Why don't you come back up? Great insights by the panel. Thank you, guys. Um, my question really is, I'm glad that we're still having the conversation. I'm, still, I'm glad we still have the opportunity to talk about it. What are some things that we can do as a security professional community to kind of ramp this up and make sure that our voices are heard and that we protect the ability to do threat intelligence? Can you guys give us a way forward? Yeah, I just wanted to sort of step in. I guess both Katie and, and Colin um, have gone through the comments extensively that have come in. And if, if you can address in that, in responding to that, also what people have been doing that doesn't help. Uh, the kinds of comments that, that can easily get dismissed because they're not helpful or, uh, you know, if we want to really empower the, the feedback that we're giving. Go ahead. Uh, so actually, um, I've been a proponent of these rules and I, I, I sat in consideration uh, going forward and thinking, wow, am I going to get lynched? Uh, coming to Black Hat, and, and I, I reached out to some friends and I thought, well, is there still a constructive output? And the answer was yes. Look, the proposed comment period is closed, but BIS, Randy Wheeler is going to be at DEF CON tomorrow. That's public. Um, that's engagement. And so even if the comment period is closed, the likelihood of, of any sort of outreach getting uh, sort of attention is very high in the meantime. In addition to that, we now know that there will be a second, uh, a second proposal, and so that will have its own comment period in which you can put in. Uh, what is helpful is not necessarily uh, uh, people put up, I think the jailbreaking community misunderstood, or I guess they understood, uh, and, and put up some very farcical comments. Uh, some known people in this, or, or aside this community, put up some hateful comments. Um, but the vast majority were people saying, I am afraid of this, this is not helpful. That's good, it provides public pressure, but what is even better is, is to say, this is the specific thing that it prevents me to do, this is what you want to enable, this is how I think that you can fix it. And so the more that people can speak to material concerns and how they affect their security operations, the more that BIS will listen to you, and what ends up happening is at the end of the day, all of those suggestions get put into a table, and the more that people are saying the same thing, the higher that that gets attention. And, and, and you should ask if you're going to be at DEF CON tomorrow, I don't know if it's a faux pas to cross-reference, uh, if, if you're going to be, 
ask Randy Wheeler directly, what can I do to help you to make sure that you have a, a rule that is constructive and doesn't put more work on you as well? Okay. If I can short be vocal. No, oh, go ahead. So in, in, in all of this, I think um, the Department of Commerce, BIS, is required to, to come up with a rule that complies with the Wassenaar arrangement. Uh, I think that they are, obviously they're engaged, they are trying to get comments back. However, um, the carve-outs that they would need to apply in order to not fundamentally impede the defense of the internet itself in all of the various ways that the panelists here and various of you in the audience um, would, would have as examples of how the rule would affect them and would affect you know, defensive uses of offense technology. I think once all of the carve-outs are presented, it will be clear that we actually need to revisit Wassenaar itself. I do not think it, it will be sufficient to uh, simply amend and amend and provide carve-outs. We will do so you know, as a community, and I think that's important, but I think that should end up raising awareness that when you provide all of the exemptions required to, to make sure that this does not impede defense, that we are going to have to go back to Wassenaar and talk about different proposals to get at, um, get at something that is more substantive and narrow to the, to the cause at hand, which is protecting human rights. Okay, so we're out of time, unfortunately, but if you want to continue the conversation, I, I believe people will be happy to answer questions outside. Um, they're going to hook us off the stage otherwise. But thank you for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.